Today is going to be exciting, and if I haven't met you, I'm Russ, I'm on the team here. Help me welcome one more time, everybody tuning in online, so glad you're with us today, and if, if you're in the room for the first time, I'd love to meet you, I'm so glad you're with us. I'm not the lead pastor, but uh, I'm so glad you're here. We actually, if you're new, just came off a series called Me and Three, who loved it? So good. And I, I don't know if it's because of just my personality wiring, or I know I'm not old, but as I get older, I, I, I get more and more into this zone where I don't wanna waste life. And I just was very impacted by this series. I, I felt so inspired. I felt just this, it inspired to become someone in three years that I would be proud of. Inspired to become somebody that is full and healthy and thriving in any area of life, anybody else. I, I, like, I just want to become somebody, and, and yet, if I'm honest, I, I think the more I get inspired, I also have to fight feelings of being overwhelmed. Anybody else? Like, anybody, when you get inspired about all the areas of your life you want to change, you also can become overwhelmed about all the areas of your life you need to change? I had a moment this week at a gas station that, that reminded me of this. I, anybody been to a gas station in a while? This is the first time in a minute, and let, can I just tell you something, in case you don't know this, gas stations are creating the future. I walked in, I don't remember which one it was, I've never seen this before, I walked in, I grabbed some snacks, I, I grabbed a little protein shake, whatever, and, and some, uh, you know, a little whatever, I grabbed like four or five items, and I go up, there's the place to pay for gas, then there's this other kind of like self-checkout thing with the scanner, and then this mysterious box. And this lady looked at me as I began to scan. I'm gonna be honest, my trip to the gas station made me feel stupid. I, I began to scan, she was oh no, sweetheart, you just, you just put it over there. And I was like, oh, okay, so I began scanning and I put it, she goes, no, 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 I felt like I was five. She goes, no, you, you don't need to scan, just put your items there. So I started putting them, one, she goes, no, put all of your items here. <laughs> I'm like, okay, why do I, why do I, this is not chemistry class. I, so I, I put all my items there, and you won't believe it. Some of you, maybe you know this. Immediately, the price came up on a screen. I didn't scan them. I don't know how it happened. And I, I just, I was, my mind was blown. I'm just gonna be honest. I was like, this is, this is incredible. I still struggle sometimes with self-checkout at Kroger, much less trying to figure out, is that a small avocado, a medium avocado, a large avocado? Do I have to press the buttons? When, for crying out loud, they're just gonna have scanned barcodes on top of it, so I don't have to guess fruit and vegetables, but uh, I, I step into 7-Eleven and I'm in Star Trek, and I just was blown away, blown away. But it made me think, don't you wish life was like that? Like, one action, take care of all the items? Wouldn't that be great? Like, if there was just like one step you could take that would trickle into every area? of your life. About 10 years ago, I read this book. It's become kind of a modern classic called The Power of Habit, Charles Duhigg. And he's this brilliant statistician, researcher, and he talked about how we develop patterns as human beings, cue, reward, all these systems. And he coined this term, maybe you've heard of it, called keystone habit. You ever heard of that? A keystone habit. And basically, it just means a habit that you ingrain into your life that becomes automatic, that correlates into other good actions, like it has a ripple effect. An example would be exercise. They say exercise is a keystone habit because it doesn't just affect you physically, but those that exercise also tend to eat better. So it ripples into other areas. There's correlating effects of exercise in mental health. My old youth pastor, no joke, when I was early college, lost over 100 pounds in a year. It, see, USA Today flew out, it was a whole thing. But he told me one day, he said, the biggest impact was actually on my spiritual health. That that physical discipline translated to my walk with God. It was a keystone habit. I, I'm old school, can I be honest? I, I, a keystone habit that I, I wish everyone would adopt is a regular time of meeting with God every single day to get in his word, get in prayer. I'm, I'm a believer that it translates into every arena of your life. So it's just a question, is there a keystone habit that could unlock? Is there a domino you could flick that would tumble into every area of your life? And it sounds like exaggeration, but James, the half-brother of Jesus, says there is. If you have your scriptures, this is James chapter three. We're gonna start in verse two. Nine o'clock, you ready? 
<laughs> all right, all right, let's go. Say, let's go. Yeah. That was stupid, all right. Um, verse two, starting here. Indeed, we all make mistakes. Anybody just on board with that already? Anybody relate? Anybody, we got a lot of areas to work on, anybody else? Indeed, we all make mistakes. And then look, he introduces a keystone habit. He says, but if we could control our tongues, everybody say, ah, seven of you, okay. If we could control our tongue, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. That's a big claim. That there's a keystone habit that if I could just control this small muscle, I could control the rest of me. That's pretty big, huh? And then he goes on to some analogies. He says this, we can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And got a, brought a picture of, isn't that just, just a glorious, like, muscular horse? And not that you didn't know what this was, but I wanted to show you something, just to show how crazy this truth is. This is a bit. An average horse weighs about 1,000 pounds. I bring this up from time to time because I don't think most of you believe me, but I used to work on a ranch in Argentina. Let's see, and here's the thing. I would show proof. I think Pastor Zach is the only person in this room that's seen proof because this was in my early 20s when I had watched Braveheart too many times and listened to a lot of country music. So the only pictures were Polaroids of me in Wranglers, no shirt, cowboy hat, looking dreamily off into the distance. So you will never see it, and if they see it, you're fired. So, but, um, <laughs> In Argentina, they didn't have saddles. It was like, it was just like, like on the old fashioned compost. They didn't have saddles. But I tell you, the one thing they did have was a bit. And isn't it crazy that the only thing that could make a beast that large go wherever you want to is a small thing in its mouth? He goes on with his analogy and he says this. He, he compares it to ships. He says it's like a ship. I'm, Whoever you are, mom, the, the, your family has promised to take you on a cruise in a month. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm kidding. <laughs> Don't write me emails. It says, a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Isn't that crazy? So the only thing that can make a large horse go wherever you want to is a small bit, and a ship, even modern ships with the engines, is something really small that makes something go anywhere you want to. And James is giving a really powerful thing that we need to catch today, and it's this. In the same way you can know where your body's moving based on where your feet are pointing, you can know where your life is going based on how your mouth is talking. That it's a small thing, not an easy thing, but a small thing, that if you want to make your life better, you can choose your words wiser. And it will translate into every area, I would write this down. These aren't on my notes, but I would just write this down. This is maybe a great place to start. If you realize that your life goes in the direction of your words, you will talk slower, think deeper, and choose wiser. You'll talk slower, think deeper, and choose wiser. And James goes on and he says this. He says, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. It's crazy to think like, Declarations of war and the greatest songs ever sung and the greatest speeches ever made all come from words that is that powerful. But then he kind of takes a dark turn and he says this, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. You ever said something that kind of, you know, ruined your life? You, you ever said something that just uh, did not help the marriage? That's deliciously awkward in here. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It's a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Wow, that went hellraiser real fast. <laughs> People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. Why does James start so powerfully and then almost end so depressingly? It's because James is showing us the power of the tongue does two things. Our words both reflect and project. They are a powerful reflection and a powerful projection. 
See, the reason that James talks about how hard the tongue is to tame is because he knows it's connected to our hearts, which are really hard to tame. You ever said something and, and, and like, <laughs> you ever had an almost out of body experience with something you said, like you saw yourself saying it and it's always, no, but you couldn't stop it? You ever followed up with, where did that come from? Here's the bad news, we know where it came from, it came from here. Jesus said this in Luke 6, 45. He said, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Another translation says it this way. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If I wanna know what's in here, I can look at what comes out of here. Hello, it's so quiet. Is it because we're sitting in this for a moment? Uh, if you, there's no microscope for the human soul, but if you wanna get a good lay of the land, you just pull up the rope, look at the bucket of all the things you've been saying, and you can know what's in the well. And so what's in the spirit? Let me, let me ask you this. What's been in your bucket lately that you've been saying? Are the words primarily words of are they fearful, negative, critical, judgmental, harsh, arrogant, lustful, sensual, proud, demeaning, hypocritical, dishonest? Or, or are the words mainly life-giving, encouraging, true, uplifting, hope-filled, faith-filled, glorifying, grateful? Are, are you a mix like me? Sometimes it's both. <laughs> It feels weird to talk about this right now because I know there's a lot of weird things going on in China, but I was in Beijing a few years ago and growing up, I became really obsessed uh, with martial arts, which led to a weird fascination with Eastern health and, and holistic healthcare. And uh, not to freak you out, uh, but like I, I got really into like Eastern like uh, meridians and, 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 and the way they eat and the way they approach. It's very holistic and it's, Weird, and to this day, I, I practice crystals, and I'm kidding, I just, <laughs> but, but I got really into like Eastern healthcare, it fascinated me, and so I was in Beijing, and this lady was talking about this, and talking about how, uh, the, the, how different the East approaches health, and, and all the different remedies, and the way they talk about it, and even mentioned, because of the population issues in China, that you have to be put on a waiting list for weeks before you would ever see a doctor. And when you go to the doctor, your appointment will last about 90 seconds. Now on the flip side, doctors actually have to spend longer in school. And the doctor will usually not take your blood. Here's what they'll usually do. They'll look at your eyes, they'll feel your pulse. They believe you have 26 pulses, not one. I know it's weird. And primarily they'll look at your tongue and they'll tell you what's wrong with you. There are famous stories of retired Chinese doctors that would watch their friends and, uh, on TV and they'll see their, the color of their tongue and there's this famous story Well, this guy texted his friend and said, there's something wrong with your liver, you need to get it checked out. And he said, I just had blood work done, I'm, I'm fine. And sure enough, before the end of the year, he had died of this condition. So she's telling us about this, I'm geeking out. Nerd Russ is like just on 10. And then she says, oh, by the way, we're five minutes away from the National Chinese Institute of Medicine. And if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, there are doctors there that for free will look at your tongue and give you a diagnosis. I'm like, count me in. This is weird, but I'm down. And it included like one of those like hot like uh, foot massages. So I was definitely in and I was like, this is gonna be awesome. Sure enough, the guy comes, context, my back's been a brick my entire life, don't know why. I've been going to a chiropractor since high school, always had lower back tension, and I think I'm good now, but I had just had blood work done where I had elevated uh, kidney stuff going on. So I, I, I'm there, doctor comes by quickly through the translator, looks at my tongue, says you have lower back issues and you need to get your kidney checked out. Now, American doctors in here may be cringing right now because I know the East and West approach it differently. All I'm saying is either there's legitimacy to how they approach some things, number one. Number two, that dude's a freaking warlock. <laughs> or number three, they really have hacked all of our TikToks and stolen all of our data. I don't know. It's <laughs> like it is, it is one of the three. 
But they believe that you can tell the health of your body by the health of your tongue. And I want you to know it's the same thing with your soul. You can tell the health of your soul by the health of your tongue. Because your speech is a reflection of your spirit. And so what's in there? And by the way, this is one of the reasons it's so important what we do Sunday mornings and why it's so important to get in the word of God in the presence of Jesus every day to let him change us from the inside out. That's why it's so important to let the truths of God's word wash over our minds and our attitudes and our perspectives because it's from the inside out that things come. But here's what I really want you to catch today. As we do all that, as we allow Jesus to change us from the inside, our tongue doesn't just reflect the world inside of us, it creates the world around us. Isn't that crazy? I don't know if you saw Oppenheimer this summer. And this may sound like an exaggeration, but this, when I was a student pastor, I used to have all the students grab their tongue. This is more powerful ah, than any weapon ever formed by uranium. No war has ever been fought. No love ever happened. Nothing in human history has ever happened apart from words. It's strange how much power they have, isn't it? You know this. You've had your day ruined by words, haven't you? And you've had your day made by words, haven't you? And my only explanation as a follower of Jesus is the way I'm designed, that God, when he created the universe, you know, in society, things go up in value when they're handcrafted, but the universe was soundcrafted. When God created the universe, he spoke and galaxies exploded out. He breathed and water and land divided. He just exhaled and said, let it be. And the stars came into place. And in the same way God created the world with his words, you and I are the only species made in the image of God and we create our world with our words. What kind of world are you creating? And I know, they're, they're, I know we're not infinite like God, there's, there's a different measure. You ever met the weird Christian that's like, oh, don't speak that into existence? You know, like you're like, how are you doing? Well, I've been kind of sick. Oh, don't say that, I, don't, I, you just spoke it. It's like, well, I, I am, I, I am sick. God doesn't want us to be superstitious with our words, but he does want us to be intentional with our words because they have the power of life and death. The power of life and death, Proverbs 18, 18, 21 says this, the tongue has the power of life and death. I've had people speak words to me that crippled my confidence, how about you? I've had people speak words to me that launched me into confidence in what I'm designed and created to do, how about you? I've had people speak, when you hear about cyberbullying and people taking their lives, teenage girls and boys taking their life, why? Words, words. Words have the power of life and death. And so what, what do we do with it? Because I know this can be inspiring but also kind of weighty, right? Anybody feel that? Here's my kind of, this is weird. This is my prayer for today. Uh, Pastor Zach, we debate, because I'm not a big like Marvel superhero movie person. Like Marvel DC, same thing. Uh, okay, lost the crowd. All right, don't say that in the 1045. Uh, but can I tell you the part I do like about superhero movies? I love the origin story where they discover they have a superpower. I love like when they find out they're invisible and they're like, like messing around with her or they find out they can fly. You know, and they're, and they're messing. My goal today is for all of us to wake up to realize we have a superpower and we can use it for life. We can use it for life. What, what, what's a good starting place? I'm gonna be really nitty gritty and just kinda get down to where we all live and get in your face and my face for a moment. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm just gonna say it. We have to stop talking bad about people. And that's just a starting place. In fact, the rest of this passage in James, that's kind of where he ends up going. Look at what he says in verse nine through 11. Sometimes it, talking about the tongue, praises our Lord and Father. Sometimes my tongue says, if you walked in sick, you're gonna walk out whole. They always love my singing. If you walked in, you know, it's just like, 
If you want to, Jesus, you're amazing. I love you. You're so pure and glorious. Sometimes my tongue, and then other times my tongue's like, did you hear what they did? Can you believe they had the nerve and audacity? Can I tell you what I really think of them? The same tongue that memorizes a Bible verse dehumanizes a political leader because I disagree with them, even though they're made in the image of God. The same tongue that blesses God on Sunday morning, sometimes I use to slander and gossip another person on Monday morning. It's so quiet, I'm just assuming it's just hitting us. He says, so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with fresh water and bitter water? He says, this shouldn't happen. It's funny, I was talking to a, a, a friend that found out I was speaking, and they're like, what are you speaking on? And I said, I'm speaking on uh, the power of the tongue. And it's just, it's so funny sometimes, I think, in Christian circles, because this person said, oh, man, I've been working on my cussing. <laughs> and I'm not demeaning that, I'm not saying that's, I'm kind of nervous about this part, to be honest. Because um, I feel like when I'm done, people are, Pastor Russ says it's okay to cuss. That's not what I'm saying. You know, if you go around dropping the F-bomb every other word, probably more intelligent ways to talk. Um, there's probably a better witness than posting profanity on whatever. There's, I, 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 think, I think wholesome speech is something we should go after. But it is funny the disproportionate value we put on certain social taboos instead of the heart of Jesus of what he's trying to communicate in Scripture. And I just gotta be honest, I could be wrong, but my 30 years of following Jesus and studying scripture lead me to believe God doesn't care nearly as much about what word comes out of your mouth when you stub your toe in the middle of the night as what comes out of your spirit to destroy another human being during the day. And I, I think this is, I actually do think this is important because I've been around Christian circles before where they will repeat people's sins in the room destroying their testimony. They will use, you know Christians, we, we have great words for gossip. Oh, I'm concerned, I have a prayer request. <laughs> you know? I mean, we fill our bull crap in all kinds of ways. Sorry. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't say the other, am I right? I'm just kidding. Um, but we, we'll, we'll fill in all kinds of ways. But I've been around places where, where they will demean, judge, condemn, speak poorly of, belittle. But if somebody were to slip and say the D word, they go, oh my, oh my. The filth that just erupted out of your orifice. Oh, golly, Pete, Lord love a duck. Honey, did you hear what they just said? They just said a wordy dirt. Yeah, and you just assassinated someone's character. Which one do you think God cares about? Can, can I just give you a few reasons we shouldn't talk bad about people? Like, we need reasons. I'm just gonna go through them quickly. Number one, anytime we speak poorly of another person, even if it's true, it says more about us than it does the other person. Because it reflects what's going on in here. People that are full of joy in life do not have the emotional energy or motivation to tear down other people. They're too busy in their lane, cheering on, living full of life. Number two, there's this weird psychological thing that they're, they're discovering now um, that if you sp your brain can't tell the difference of when you're speaking bad about somebody else or yourself. It's weird, did you know this? I I'm thinking about Nate Bargatze the other night. He's like, yeah, a dumb brain and a smart brain. But it's true. So when you speak about somebody else, you actually wound your own soul. You ever got done speaking really bad about somebody and you just felt icky inside? One of the reasons is because God created us to live interconnected and our souls in, in a weird way can't tell the difference between when we're wounding somebody else and wounding ourselves. It actually affects us when we demean somebody else. Uh, a third reason is, is this. Uh, wise people will take notice. Uh, if a, a healthy person, if you, stop, if you start talking bad about somebody that's not in the room, you know what they'll say to themselves? If they'll talk about, bad about them when they're not in the room, they will talk bad about me when I'm not in the room. Fourth, you're like, Russ, I, I get it. I don't think we do get it. Fourth is this. You could say a careless word that lodges into somebody's psyche for the rest of their lives. 
I've experienced this. Anybody, I, I told this story before about the, the girl in second grade that told me I had a, a pointy nose. For the rest of my life, I've sat on the right side of a girl in the movie theater. It's like, why do you keep switching seats? I'm like, because I want to protect you in case an intruder comes in. I the exit's over there, honey. Um, <laughs> But I've had dark words. You could say a word. It could be small like that. It could be big. You could say, the, your words have power. And here's the fifth thing. And I, I know this is just really spiritual, but can I just say this? Can we just go for this? God doesn't like it. And, and if you flip over a chapter to James 4, we don't have this on the screen, but the message paraphrase says something like this. I love it. It says, don't bad mouth each other friends. By doing so, you write graffiti all over the gospel. Imagine writing graffiti over a McDonald's or a bank. Then imagine the weight of writing graffiti over the gospel. Uh, this makes me feel old, but 10 years ago, I became a student pastor, youth pastor in Atlanta. And one of my first Wednesdays that I spoke to a bunch of students, I told them, I said, I don't know all the vision for what we're gonna do as youth ministry. I said, but here's one thing. I'll just go ahead and tell you this in my heart right now, is that we'd be a no graffiti youth group. I'm biased, but isn't this an amazing church? I mean, the preaching, the worship, the way I do announcements, it's <laughs> awesome. And we have an amazing church. But can we just dream for a minute? What if we really did continue to become a no graffiti church? What if we became a church where if, somebody, if you make a mistake, the shelf life for gossip is small and you know that your name is defended in rooms you're not in. What, what, if, what if we became a no graffiti church where anytime you're tempted to talk bad about somebody else, you remember the words of Jesus, that you're not supposed to talk about people, you're supposed to go to people and settle it with them. What if we, because I, I know what some people think, well, we gotta speak the truth in love, right? Yeah, two key phrases, speak the, speak the truth to, not about. Number one, and number two, in love. When you have relational equity and people know you're in their corner and you've loved them and been there for them and been loyal to them, and then in the right way, in the right moment, in the right spirit, you speak a word of challenge to make them better, that has powerful impact. But if you don't have that, you're just annoying. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I'm just gonna go for it. I just, I'm up here, I might as well. What if you knew that anybody speaking bad about you ended with them? What if this became the kind of place where you people cheered you on instead of criticizing you, rooted you on, had your back? What if we became a no graffiti church? I, I, I was in Argentina forever ago, I told you that, and I'll be honest, I went through a phase where me and some buddies, it was kind of like a, I don't know, a fraternity thing, and I, I'm ashamed to even say this now, but we really started making fun of people. I mean, bad, and I, I love some good sarcasm. I joke, and we have our staff, oh my gosh, our staff, we're ruthless with each other in a very funny way. But, but to the point where I honestly, I felt like it was cruel. And we were just, it was just us. People weren't around. I was kind of in a distant place for God, and you, you ever just like, if you laugh about something, you kind of imagine God laughs about it too, and then he's cool with it? Hello. And I came across a verse that pierced me. I mean, pierced me. Psalm 50, 19 through 21 says this. You give your mouth to evil and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You, slander, you sit around and talk bad about people. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you. You thought I was cool with it. But I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. I don't know why, and you guys are like, this is heavy stuff. I don't know why that whole year of rebellion in Argentina, this verse put the fear of God back in my heart. I thought God's not cool with me bad mouthing sons and daughters of God made in his own image. And what if we discover today that we have a superpower that we could use for life instead of death? When you're walking in, you probably got one of these 
cheap plastic black rubber bands. You want to grab them? Everybody have them? All right. And you may have seen something like this before, but I, I just thought to myself, you know, Pastor Tim's been talking about how our future goes the direction of our patterns, right? Nine o'clock, did I depress you? You good? You there? Our, our future goes in the direction of our patterns, right? Hello? And we build our patterns by building practices. Just, what if we went on an exciting exercise as a church family and spent the next seven days building a pattern of only speaking life? And anytime you catch yourself speaking death, speaking negative about somebody else, yourself, whatever, your future, whatever, not hurt yourself, this isn't a punishment thing, this isn't mac, you know, masochism, but just as a, as a Pavlovian training tool, I wonder if we'd become slower to speak. I, I wonder, kind of like a plane that just goes one mile in a different direction but ends up in a completely different destination, I wonder if we just adjusted a little bit this much over the next seven days where our life would go. You in? I, I think this could make us slower to speak. I, I, I think some, <laughs> some of you may sleep on the couch fewer nights. <laughs> you know what I also hope? I, I, I hope this doesn't just become a reminder of what not to say, but what to say. What, what, what if this week, here's my prayer, this is how practical my mind works. What, what, what if this week you're in line and instead of scrolling social media, you see this and you realize, oh, I could send three or four quick texts to my friends that could and completely make their day and speak life and give life into somebody that needs hope. What if you see this in line to buy food and you decide, hey, I just need to be reminded that that person behind the counter is a human being and might be having a bad day, so when I get up there, I'm gonna look them in the eye and smile and ask them how their day's going. Maybe this is a reminder that I can call somebody today. Maybe this is a reminder that I can speak life over myself. I'm just saying, what if we spoke life instead of death over our lives? You're like, speak life over what? Well, I, I got a few ideas. Number one, how about this? Speak life over your future. Anybody like me, sometimes enough disappointment comes in, enough shame comes in, before I know it, I'm repeating lies in my head. Rush, you're never gonna get that. You're never gonna get past that. You're never gonna get better than that. This is never gonna happen for you. Rush, you're never gonna get past this. You're never gonna get over that. This is never gonna come to pass. And in my mind, I keep thinking about the spies of Israel. When God wanted to send his people out of the desert into the promised land and he sent 12 spies and 10 came back with a negative report and spoke death over their future. They said, we can't do it. I know God promised it, but have you seen the giants? Have you seen how big the problems are? Have you seen how big the obstacles are? And only two people came back, Caleb and Joshua, and said, I don't care how big the giants are. God promised it, God will do it. We can do this. With God's help, we will make it through. With God's help, I will, come on. I will overcome the addiction. I will get past this battle. Battle. I will see God's calling in my life come to pass. Some of you that have depression on you, you need to stop listening to yourself and start speaking to yourself. Getting up in the morning, I will live and not die, says the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I know the plans he has for me, plans to prosper me, to give me a hope and a future and not to harm me. Start speaking life over your future. You need to become a ruthless virus inside your mind that catches the lies of the enemy and squashes them and redirects them and speaks life over your future. How about your relationships? When I was in Atlanta one time they had me pick up like a musical artist from the airport and take him back to the church, and I kind of geeked out a little bit, because he, back when I was growing up, early in the faith, it was like this kind of famous musical group that I used to listen to, and so I was a little nervous, and so I'm try trying to be a good driver, good chauffeur, not say anything, but he's so pastoral, he starts like asking me questions, like, okay, Pastor Rush, are you married? Like, are you dating some, you know, so asking all these very invasive questions, and, um, <laughs> and so I'm like talking to him, like, no, you know, I'm not, and, and he just begins to speak to me about marriage. And I've done some weddings in here, so you may have heard me say this, this is where I got it. He told me something I'll never forget, and by the grace of God, get married one day, is something I wanna a practice, but he said, Russ, do you know where the word husband comes from? I said, obviously I don't, I guess not. 
He said it come, it's an agricultural term. It comes from husbandry. And he said, Russ, there's a lot of different factors that go into marriages that go good or bad. He said, but in general, he said, what people don't realize is the harvest of the marriage they eventually get goes back to the seeds that they were planting each day. He said what people don't realize is some people choose in their marriage to sow words of life and affirmation and encouragement and joy and belief and, and hope into their spouses and 20 years down the line after sowing prayers and encouragement and life daily, there's a beautiful harvest, he said. And then other times, people daily sow words of critique and harsh tones and discouragement and death and judgment and critical spirit. And then 20 years down the line, wonder why their harvest is what it is. He said, I know there's different factors, but I just thought, could that be true of all our relationships? Could a great question be, what do you want your relationships to taste like? Bitter, sweet, encouraging, hopeful? What do you want your future to taste like? What, you, what do you want your life to taste like? We get to shape this. Dr. Ima, I think it's Imaro Mazarutu, he's a, laughing, I don't know how to say his name, but he's a Japanese researcher, photographer, and back in the 90s, he became famous for all of his photos and research on frozen water crystals. And you can look it up, you can Google it. They studied water that had words of life and hope spoken over it, and words that had ugly words, water that had ugly words spoken over it, and the shape and structure of the water literally changed. All you plant people are like, yes, I tell my fiddle leaf I love it every day. I tell little Chucky, hello, every day. Some of it's pseudoscience, some people debate it. I don't really care. I don't know if your words can shape water, but I know they shape people's spirits. They speak to your future. Use your words to build your faith. Use your, use your words to talk to God, be honest with them, but also be grateful. I gotta say, after 20, years of following Jesus, I still have to do this. Some people don't struggle being honest with God. I don't know that I really struggle with that. Maybe I do, maybe there's moments where I'm not honest with myself, therefore it's hard to be honest with God, but for the most part, I feel pretty free to tell God. Like, I just, I just come to the conclusion a long time ago, he knows anyways, and he's big enough to handle it. So I just tell God how I feel. I'm not always great at reminding myself how good is my life? God, thank you today that air's in my lungs. Bless you today. I was made to give you glory. I was made to give you praise. And if you never do another thing, I'm gonna wake up this morning with praise on my lips. The psalmist says to bless the Lord at all times and let his praise be on my lips, who does wonders for us. He's the one who made me. He's the one who came for me. He's the one who died for me. He's the one who shed blood for me. He's the one who gave me new mercies every single moment morning to wake up with breath in my lungs and strength in my legs. And then, can I just say this? This may sound blasphemous. I think there may be somebody even more important how you speak to them than the people around you and maybe even to God. And it's the way you speak to you. Some of you are great defenders of bullies. The only bully you've never stood up to is the one inside your own soul. And the biggest problem is not that people have rejected you, the problem is you've let insecurity get inside you and you've rejected you. And you become small in your own eyes and you speak to yourself in a way that you would never allow somebody else to speak to you. And so I wanna do something if you'll stand with me as we close. I love when Pastor Jesse's talked about this whole idea of speaking declarations over your soul. Some of you may think, ah, oh, that's kind of cheesy. Well, if being in the same camp as Tony Robbins and Oprah Winfrey and the greats and every single professional sports team and category in life makes me cheesy, I want to be cheesy. Because there's power of life and death in my tongue. And when we used to do XU, we, we created this list of truths, not just truths that we 
plucked out of our head, but truth rooted in scripture. And if you've ever wondered, why does it matter to speak scripture of your life? I just want you to consider something for a moment. If your tongue has the power of life and death, right? Everybody nod your head. If your tongue has the power of life and death, and God's word is divinely inspired, sharper than any two-edged sword, an unquenchable fire magnified above the heavens, the grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of God abides forever, the eternal word of God. What do you think happens if you were to combine the intrinsic power of your words with the eternal power of God's words and speak that nuclear power over your life and future every single day, over your identity, over your soul? What would happen if daily you began to remove the lies planted in your soul about your worth and replace them with the truth of what God says about who you are? What if daily you began to speak to the lies of the spirit of anxiety and fear you feel and replaced it with, I've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind? What in God's name do you think would happen? Happen if you spoke the word of God over your soul every day. I've seen miracles happen from this, and we're gonna try it. Are you ready? Okay, I'm not encouraged. That was not a word of life groan that you just gave. Let me tell you something. I used to do this, and I am really annoying about this. If you begin to sound like sloths, we will repeat over and over. lock the doors. We will repeat over. <laughs> You know who you are to leave early, lock the doors. You, we will go over and over. So when we declare these truths, who I am in Christ, if you start, who I am in Christ. No, we're gonna say these like we're Incan warriors, deal? Nah, no, no. We're gonna say them like we mean them, all right? All right, let's go. With me, on three, one, two, three. I am chosen, chosen and adopted by God. Louder, I am complete in Christ. I am free from guilt and condemnation. Louder, I am a follower of Jesus. I am a friend of Jesus. He calls me friend. My legal debt has been paid and I have been justified. I have been bought with a price and my life and body belong to God. I am God's child. God is working both the good and bad in my life for good. I am confident God will complete the work he started in me. Keep going louder. I am significant. I am God's workmanship. I am God's temple. I can approach God with freedom and confidence. I am a citizen of heaven. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I've been established, anointed, and sealed by God. I've not been given a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. I am accepted. Is that it? I don't even know. Come on. Come on, you believe that? If you do, put your hands straight up. Tell God, thank you for who I am. I bless you. I use my words and I declare you're glorious. I declare you're wonderful. I declare you're worthy. Thank you for who I am. I speak life and not death. I speak life over myself, over my family, my friends, my future, my children. I will live and not die, says the Lord. Thanks so much for tuning in to this message. I hope that it encouraged you and inspired your faith. If God is doing something in your life, would you take a moment and let us know? We wanna connect with you and we wanna be able to pray for you. All you have to do is shoot us an email to hello at the x.church, or you can always send us a DM on one of our social media platforms. And if you know somebody that would also be encouraged by this very message, why not take a moment and just share it with them right now? And as always, I wanna say thank you to every single person who so generously financially supports this ministry so we can continue to get messages like these out to people all over the world. We believe God is building something special and you're a significant part of it. Until next time, have a great day.